Okay, what uh, we're going to do now is we're going to take a quick run through of the the circuit that the capacitor is um, uh, is built on. So we'll run through the uh, various parts of the PCB as they it relates to the schematic, and we will talk a bit about how the uh, the circuit operates. So first of all, orienting ourselves between the board and the schematic. We'll begin, let's say, with the power supply. So there's the power supply on the schematic. It's an LM, or sorry, an L uh, 78LO5, which is a five volt voltage regulator. There's a couple of filter capacitors on either side. There is a diode for reverse polarity protection. And we've got an input of, I think these go up to 12 or 18 volts, I forget which, but you can check the data sheet on them. There is an option for having a um, a jumper, a uh, direct input rather than using the uh, the battery leads. So this is the battery lead symbol here, and that corresponds to this part of the board here with our input filter capacitor, and our voltage regulator and our output filter capacitor. So that's C5, C1, and our U4, which is our voltage regulator, and then. If you want, or if you have a filtered 5 volt supply already, you can put that in, uh, put a jumper in there and feed it directly 5 volts if you wanted to build this into something. So that's the power supply. Next, let's talk about the decade counters and show the schematic for those. So our decade counters are the units digit and our tens digit, and the way that works is pulses come in. Uh, on the clock line, so that's into pin 14 of this. So clock is coming from our one half of our triple five timer uh, pair, and it counts those clock pulses. And once it gets to 10, it sends a clock pulse out. Um, sorry, it sends a clock pulse out on pin 12, and that becomes the input to the next triple five time, or sorry, to the next decade counter, which now counts how many times this one has counted up to 10. So you get your units, zero through nine, and then you get your tens, um, zero through nine. So zero to 90, zero to nine. And that's how these two um, decade counters are connected. And this is the schematic um, for them. And we have a couple of small filter capacitors that filter the power rail close to the uh, close to the uh, 4017, and there's another one close. Uh, sorry, close to the 4017, and another one close to the 4017. So C3 and C4. These are filter capacitors that are uh, filtering between plus five and ground. Yeah, BD pin 14 and pin 8. 14 and 8. So that filters power. And that filters power for these two decade counters. The next part we're going to take a look at is the range selection portion of the board, and that's over here, um, excluding those two diodes. So these resistors and these jumpers are represented here on the schematic, and they allow you to select what your um, what your um, range is going to be by adjusting the um, period of one half of your triple five timer, which is this chip here. So by adjusting this, you can adjust how fast you're counting, because you need to adjust how fast you're counting because on the other half of the triple five timer, which is this chip here, you're going to have a capacitor under test that is adjusting the length of time that you're going to be doing counts for. So the length of time that you're going to be doing counts is changing by um, is changing depending on what the value of your capacitor under test is, and since you only have a um, hundred. Um, digits to um, count in, you need to adjust the range or the length of time that you're, the, sorry, how fast uh, pulses you're going to be generating for counting that so that they fit into a period of 
your device under test. But we'll talk more about that um, later. But in any event, you've got range selection, you've got on the other side the, the capacitor under test creating a different square wave, and then you've got a um, AND gate that's created with this, uh, with this um, MOSFET, the 2N7000, and a pair of diodes. That creates a, um, a, uh, an AND gate. So yeah, and we'll go into detail about all of the various parts of the circuit um, next. That's just an orientation of the board to the schematic. So inside of a triple five timer is essentially this block diagram. A pair, uh, first of all, there is a voltage divider that sets two reference voltages, two thirds of VCC and one thirds of VCC. Each of those are input to the negative pin of a comparator. So we've got two comparators that are going to look at the two um, external pins on the triple five. They're going to look at the trigger and they're going to look at um, a threshold. That's what those two pins are called. So the trigger pin, once the voltage at the trigger pin is above one thirds VCC, it will set a set reset latch and that will remain high um, until such time as the reset is um, triggered on the set reset latch. And there's two ways you can do that. You can either externally reset it via pin four, or you can uh, bring the voltage at pin six above a threshold. In this case, it is two thirds VCC. So it triggers at below one third uh, at one third VCC and then there's a threshold above two thirds VCC that can reset this latch. Then there's just an output amplifier stage that sends the output of this um, set reset latch to the output pin so it can um, I think it can source up to 200 milliamps of current. So the last thing we're going to talk about is the discharge pin uh, on a triple five uh, timer chip. So the discharge pin is connected to a transistor that is that has its um, uh, emitter con connected to ground. So if this transistor is in conduction mode, that means that the discharge pin is connected to ground. When is this discharge pin going to get connected to ground? If this transistor is conducting, which means that there is some current flowing into the base. When's there going to be current flowing into the base is when there's going to be a logic um, one here. So there's some um, current available to flow between, uh, so when this is brought above ground potential. So when is that going to happen? That's going to happen if the this has got a logic one. Now this is an invert symbol on our set reset latch. So when this latch has been reset, that means hits has been reset. That means that this is going to be logic low in the set reset, but inverted means that this is going to be logic high when it's been reset. So when it's been reset, when is it gonna, that going to happen? That's going to happen when your voltage comes above threshold or the control voltage, depending on how you have your external chip configured. So if this comparator senses a threshold voltage above two thirds of VCC or whatever the control voltage is, then the discharge pin gets connected to ground. And that is the fundamental thing that you use in order to create what we need here for our circuit, which is the A-stable multivibrator configuration of a triple five timer. So a triple five timer in an A-stable multivibrator configuration is um, works by charging up a capacitor through a pair of resistors, R1 and R2. You've got both your threshold and your trigger pins, pins two and pin six, sorry, um, trigger and threshold pins, pins two and pin six, are are looking at the voltage across this capacitor. So as you're charging R1, your capacitor up, you're charging it up through R1 and R2. Now, once threshold is reached, um, the threshold voltage, or two-thirds of VCC, 
what happens is the um, the uh, the discharge pin um, becomes connected to ground. So that means that we can discharge our capacitor through R2. So R2 controls how long it takes for threshold to fall down to our um, threshold to fall down to our trigger value and R1 plus R2 control how long it takes for our um, voltage to rise from trigger up to threshold because once our capacitor here our trigger fall once our voltage falls below trigger it then turns off our discharge so that's no longer connected to ground discharge is no longer connected to ground and that means that this is now open so all we're doing is we're charging up our capacitor through R1 and R2 and that's the basic operation of a triple five timer okay so how do we calculate the um, frequency of our triple five timers and in relation to R1, R2, and C. Okay, we've got two things going on here. We've got a threshold voltage of one third VCC, two thirds VCC. So what happens is you've got, if this is our voltage and this is our time, you're going to be charging up a capacitor till it gets to two-thirds and then discharging it and then charging it up again and then discharging it. So, and this capacitor charge is going to be dependent on the value of R1 plus R2 and C and the discharge curve is going to be determined by R2 and C. So it charges up in one direction, charges down, depending on these two different um, RC circuits. And so the formula for calculating the charge time and discharge time is, so the frequency in total is how long does it take to go from there to there. The frequency is, sorry, to go from here to here would be one cycle. So the frequency is one over the natural log of two times the capacitance times R1 plus twice R2. And why is that? Well, um, the frequency is going to be composed of the time that it takes to charge up here and discharge here. The, the charge time is um, 1 over the natural log of RC, but in the charging up section, it's R1 plus R2. And in the discharging section, it's just R2. So we've got R2 twice, but C is common. And if you do the um, algebra, it reduces to this formula. So the frequency is the length of time that it takes to go from there to there. T1, T0. When it first starts up, you have a little extra time here that it takes to start up because it has to, first of all, get its way up to a third of the VCC before it finishes this part of the cycle, but after it starts up, it's all T naught to T1. So then there are two other portions to this. How much time does it spend in high versus how much time does it spend in low? So um, the high is equal to natural log of 2 times C 
times R1 plus R2. And the time it spends in low is natural log of 2 C R2. And frequency um, is the inverse of the period. So the period is the amount of time. So that's how long it takes for something. And then frequency is number of periods per second. So periods per second. So yeah, those are the equations that we need to keep in mind when we're um, charging up, when we're, when we're designing a, uh, um, a stable multivibrator. Okay, so here is the timing diagram of the circuit. So we've got the two um, the two a stable multivibrators, the the one that's generating a um, a reference clock, and then we have the one that is generated based on the capacitor under test. So what you do is the capacitor under test will produce some sort of square wave with an on time and an off time. And then your, if you trigger your um, reference clock to produce pulses while the capacitor under test is high and you count these and then while it's low you then display the count and then you go start counting again and so on and so forth so that is the uh, capacitor under test signal, and then this is the the uh, Sadie. Good grief! Yeah, every time I start talking, the mean or the measuring counts. So we count those up, display them, count display and that's what the basic operation of the circuit is but now <clears throat> we've got the problem well, a couple problems so first of all we want to start our counting at the same time that we're starting uh, that this um, the capacitor under test sends its multivibrator high and so how do we do that well, um, with a circuit that's called a differentiator. And a differentiator looks like this. And the reason it's called a differentiator is because if a signal comes in here, the output is going to be proportional to the rate of change of the voltage across this capacitor. So if we feed it in a square wave pulse, what comes out the other side will be something that looks like this. And then it'll decay off. And then when it comes back down, so there's a change, you'll get a something that looks like this. And then it decays back down. So what what we end up getting is on a rising edge you get a peak and then this capacitor discharges back down to zero because we now have a direct current across this capacitor and they're short and they're they're a uh, they're a short circuit for an open circuit for dc and so this capacitor gets discharged via this resistor and then when there's a drop in voltage, now there is going to be a negative spike because the slope is going downwards, differentiator. But 
uh, we don't want this part of the um, of the output, the uh, the negative part, because we don't want to feed negative voltages into our um, triple five because it um, can't can't tolerate that. So what we do is we put a diode onto ground across the the resistor, so that um, it uh, it will snub the negative portion to approximately negative 0 0.6 volts. Another part of the circuit that is um, very interesting is the ability to limit the number of counts between 0 and 99. Because if you were to allow it to wrap around, you would get ambiguous readings. So was 147 counts supposed to be um, 4.7 microfarads or is it um, 1,000 or 14.7 microfarads, it, for example. So if it wraps around, you get, you, since we've only got two digits of precision, we have to limit the amount of counts to be between 0 and 99 so that we don't get that aliasing artifact. So how does that work? Well, he creates a nice AND gate because what we want to do is we want to stop our counts if we have a 9 here in the units and a 9 here in the tens, so 99. Okay, so ignore this part for now. If the gate here is um, held at less than 2, approximately, 2 volts, that means that this MOSFET will be turned off and therefore the signal can happily, so it's not conducting the underground, so it will happily send the clock signal out. But what happens if um, we pull this um, above 2 volts? Well, if we pull it above 2 volts using um, uh, a pull-up resistor to um, plus 5 volts, that will turn this MOSFET on because the voltage is above its threshold voltage, and then this will start. That means that this main clock will be now connected to ground, which means that we have got a, a zero. So when this MOSFET turns on, it, um, it pulls this to zero, so that means we've got a signal that's just goes like that. It's being held at zero. Now, if we if we look at these two diodes now, if the units is high, that means this diode can't conduct because they're both at logic high. And if this tens digit nine is high, that means this can't conduct either, and that means that this plus 5 volts actually appears at the gate. And so if both of these are high, that means we've got conduction. Uh, we've got this at a, above 2 volts, so the MOSFET turns on and then we get to 0. But if either one or both of these are 0, or logic low, that means that there is conduction through here because this is at a low, which means that um, this is going to be, this is going to be below two volts because this is shorted to ground. So, if both of these are at nine, we shut off, we turn on our MOSFET and short this out to ground, but if either one of these is low, or both of them are low, that means that this MOSFET is off and the clock goes out. So we've got an AND gate created by these two diodes, this MOSFET, and these two resistors. Very nice little circuit. Okay, so we've now got to figure out how fast this clock needs to be this main clock in order to count the number of pulses, the, the correct number of pulses for our, uh, for our capacitor under test. So as an example, 
on the uh, on the board here, we have a number of different ranges. We've got 0 to 9.9 .9 microfarads. We've got 0 to 0.99 microfarads. We've got 0 to 0 0.099 microfarads, which is the same thing as 99 nanofarads. Or we can go from 0 to 9.9 .9 nanofarads. So let's just take this, this top range because that's the... Uh, that's going to be the the fastest range that we're going to have to do. Yeah, fastest range we're going to have to do. So, um, say we've got a nine. Oh, I've got to stop leaving the cap off of this pen. Say we've got a nine point nine microfarad capacitor that we're going to be testing. And remember, um, that's our equate. That's our our timer circuit, we've got an R1, R2, and our capacitor. So, um, R1 is on our circuit board is corresponds to R11. And so that is a, I think, 13K is R1 and 130K is R2. The time that that pulse is going to be high is equal to the natural log of 2 times R1 plus R2 times C. And the C is 9.9 .9 microfarads. So that is natural log. 0.693, let's call it. I should remember that number because it comes up so f frequently. 0 0.693. So that's 0 0.693. Um, 13K plus 130K is 143K and times our capacitance in farads, which is 9.9 .9 times 10 to the negative... Um, six. Okay, so that is point six nine three times one forty three thousand times nine point nine, which equals, and then divide that by ten to the sixth, and that equals, no, oh, that equals zero point nine eight. One second. So it's going to take just under a second of high time for that 9.9 .9 microfarad capacitor, given these two values of our resistors in our in our um, circuit under test. So or our capacitor under test. This is equal to our capacitor. X in the documentation. <clears throat> okay, so now what we want to do is we want to get approximately 99 counts in that 0 0.981 seconds, right? Because if this is the signal of our uh, uh, this is the the um, the square wave that we're generating with our capacitor under test, we want to get as many counts as is possible because this is the top of our range, as many counts as possible in in that time so that we've maximized our resolution. So we want 99 pulses in that 0 0.981 seconds. So what does that mean? <clears throat> And that means that our frequency has to equal 99 divided by 0 0.981. So that's going to be cycles per second. So the units make sense. And that turns out to be a frequency of... <clears throat> uh, invert that times 99 equals 100.9. Nine zero nine.
hertz cycles per second. So that's what we're looking at. So forget that. That's too much precision. 100.9 hertz is what we're, our target frequency is for our main clock or our counting clock. Now, doing a bit of a dimensional analysis, if we wanted to do this from 9... Uh, point nine nine microfarads, or then that would be our maximum range for our capacitor under test. That means that we've got, um, uh, so we're moving a, a decimal over. So this is ten to the, this is ten to the negative seven. So that means this is going to be happening in 0 0.981 seconds. So <clears throat> that means this has to be um, so that's going to go up to 1.001 kilohertz. And then if this is going to be at a range of 99 nanofarads, this is now become 10 to the negative um, 8. So that makes this um, 98 point, uh, sorry, moving the decimal two places is 98.1. So that makes this equal to um, 10.01 kilohertz. And then the lowest range is 9.9 um, .9 nanofarads. And that corresponds to 100.1 kilohertz clocks. And so then we just have to design a second, um, uh, a stable multivibrator, so that it can produce these frequencies of clocks. And then we count them using our our decade counters. So yeah, uh, that is that's basically how that circuit is working. It's genius. It's total genius. I wish I, I really do wish I had had in high school somebody that was willing to teach me enough about electronics that I was able would be able to understand this back then. That would have been something else, man. Um, congratulations on the uh, the school system in the UK because it must be pretty awesome in order to uh, to teach stuff like this. So that is probably um, enough for one video. Um, it will probably um, stretch much longer than I had wanted it to. Um, but I do want to do some more um, work on this um, board because um, it's totally understandable and I would like to try and work through all of the mathematics that's involved in doing the design effort on it. And so if um, anybody's interested, there will be a video coming um, shortly about the, that topic, and that is running through basically the um, um, all of the various calculations that would go into coming up with the values that you would need in order to um, to populate um, a board and actually affect the design that um, this uh, this board has. So um, yeah, that will be a, a future video. But until now, um, thank you very much for watching. Um, again, Jez, thank you very much for creating this uh, project and sharing it with um, Sar and uh, Ben and allowing us to have a glimpse into, um, into the world of capacitance testing using uh, Clever Circuits. Anyways, yes, thanks everyone for watching and I will talk to you all later. Bye for now.